Welcome to the service this morning. And uh, first thing we will do is go and make our declarations for this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. All right, so let's take our confession one to go. As I say to listen to the word of God today, a door of utterance has been opened unto us, and I hear the voice of God clearly speaking to me. This is the way to go, walk ye in it. I listen under the influence of the Spirit of God, and I'm not distracted by anything or anyone. The Word of God is food to my spirit. I am strengthened by it this morning. It is wine to my heart, creating joy within me. It is oil to my face, causing my life to shine, giving me victory in everything that I do. As my eyes make contact with the scriptures used in this message, the Spirit of God opens new things to me. He also brings to my remembrance things Jesus once showed me. I come to understand God's system on the earth, and I receive instruction, encouragement, correction, and the enablement to live out God's will. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, this morning we continue our series, which we're starting on the laws of proper speech. And there is nothing as detailed in the scriptures as practical insights that God gives onto how we ought to use our tongue. Jesus said, this is the commandment that I have received of the Father, what I should say and what I should speak. And he said, this commandment is life eternal. And as we get deeper into this discourse by the Spirit of God, we will see that all events that happen in the life of a person are either intentionally spoken into existence, authorized or permitted by words that people speak most of the time in ignorance as to the import and how the enemy might use those words that are spoken and you are not saying them directly into your own life. It's in conversations that you have with people, particularly the way you speak to others or speak about others. This is what the enemy is using as a point of entry into the lives of people. And as we go into this teaching at the end of this month, or you take a little bit of, a little, might go a little bit more than all right, September, uh, we'll come to understand and we'll get cured of all forms of ignorance concerning it, shut the door permanently on the enemy and begin to step into the fullness of what God wants to do within our lives. Uh, the scripture tells us that death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it are making, are eating of its fruit thereof. Uh, the word they that love it means that phrase, it means they that are making use of it are actually eating of its fruit thereof. Now, we've just looked at this from just one standpoint, from just one perspective, that if I'm not intentionally speaking words of death, then it means that uh, what I am saying in effect cannot administer death. Or when I speak life is when I intentionally say things that try to pronounce a blessing into my life or speak certain things into existence. Now, that is true, but it goes much deeper than that. So this goes beyond words we intentionally speak into our lives to generate power for our advancement. We are getting into when the scripture talked about death and life are uh, in the power of the tongue. It goes deep into the conversations that we have, like we've said conversations we have with people every single day. Every time you interact with people, you are enacting a spiritual law. Every time you pass a comment there about something happening in the life of a person, you are enacting a spiritual law. So it goes deep into the conversations we have every day. What we say to or about others directly impacts our own life. And we've said this, it has a direct impact on our lives. So it's not about getting into some legalistic bondage when it comes to speaking words. Whereas people will say things like, um, you know, somebody uses a phrase and say, no. Uh, uh, um, uh, someone says, for example, I am coming downstairs. You say, no, 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 no. I don't go down. I only go up. 
So even when I'm going downstairs, I will say, I am, you know, that, that's not what that, that's not what he's talking about. Yeah. All right. We start getting into legalistic things. All right. When people say, are you coming down? You say, no, I never go down because I'm above only. And then you, you click your fingers. That's not the principle that God is saying here. It's talking about conversations. We'll see this. Uh, the tongue among our members holds a very strategic position. A very strategic position. That's why it tells us in James chapter 3. Let's look at that. James chapter 3. Uh, it tells us, for in many things, verse 2, we offend all. Uh, and it says, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Now, this is not part of the message, but let me just say this here. The reason why he's saying be not many masters, which means once you come into a position of authority, the effect your words have on people is much, much stronger than you just. Which means if a pastor of a church talks to a congregation member and says, I don't think you will make it, that chap is not going to forget that those words were said to him or her. If somebody in authority says something, a teacher, all right, or a parent, and it's speaking about that, that in many things we offend all. But he says, if you are in authority, make sure you don't offend in speech. Make sure you don't speak words into the lives of people to demoralize them, to, to cause pain in their hearts. It says, if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and is able to bridle his whole body. And then he goes in verse 4 and says, Behold, sheep, though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds. Yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listed. Even so, the tongue is a little member. So we're looking at the strategic role of the tongue among our members. It's strategic role. Now, there was a vessel in the temple of God that was sanctified and separated for the purpose of taking the sacrifices of the Jewish people from the earth and it will ascend into heaven. It was from this vessel, it proceeded forth from the earth into the heavens and it was sanctified for that particular purpose and dedicated to that. Now, our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, the tongue is, plays the role of that same vessel. We understand the Old Testament are types and shadows of the new. So the tongue holds that role of transferring things, spiritual sacrifices, out of the earth. Your prayers, your praise, even your physical offerings that become spiritual sacrifices by reason of the words you speak over those particular things are transported in their spiritual forms out of the earth into heaven. Now, the tongue actually is responsible for that. No other part of the body can do that. And this says to us how strategic and vital the tongue is, just as that vessel was vital in the temple, all right, in the Old Testament. Now, so it says here, even so the tongue is a little member. It says, yet they are turned about a very small hand with us, whoever the governor listed. Even so, the tongue is a little member, but boasted of great things. In other words, it's little among all the other members, but it can boast to the other members here that I'm responsible for all the great things that are happening. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the entire body. The tongue can defile and poison every organ within the body, and it says, and can set on fire the entire cycle of that person's existence by a fire that is fed from hell. So the tongue can literally destroy every other part of the body and affect the life of that person and allow, all right, the intent of hell itself to be transmitted into the existence of that person setting the whole experience of that person on the earth by a fire that is fed, all right, from hell. So it says, for every kind of beast and birds and of serpents and things in the sea is tamed and has been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. 
So it can poison the body. It can poison the entire life. Now, we think, now this is where we're getting to, that when it says that it's being fed from the fire of hell to poison the body and to poison the entire life, we're talking about words like what we describe where you are intentionally saying negative things, like I will not make it. You know, I, I will, you know, that's wrong, but it's beyond that. When James was going to talk about poisonous words, look at what he says. Therewith we bless God, even the Father, and we curse men that are created after the similitude or image of God. In other words, he says this poison is found in what we say about people. The way in which people poison their body and set the whole entire cycle of their existence there with a fire that is fed from hell is through provocative speech. In other words, Satan is pushing and inspiring people to say things about other people and they don't understand that those words poison their own bodies, poison their lives, and affect the experiences that they have on the earth. So Satan desires, we say this, control over the tongue, for he knows with that he can control the entire body. We've seen here it says that, uh, behold, we put bits in horses' mouths, and they obey us, and we control the entire body. He understands that he can control the entire body, and he also understands that he can affect the entire life. So he seeks to control that. And that's why in Ecclesiastes says, I will not suffer my mouth to cause my flesh to sin. It speaks about that in Ecclesiastes. I will not suffer my mouth to cause my flesh there to sin. So Satan knows something. All right, the scripture is up. Let's read it. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. In other words, when the flesh even goes and does things, the mouth authorized it, right? It says, neither say thou before an angel that it was an error. It says, wherefore God should be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thy hands. And I'm going to look at four things that words like this destroy. It affects the work of our hands. Directly affects what comes as a result all right, or work of our hands. So Satan knows something. And we also have to know this. Right? Now he understands that in the Old Testament, we've spoken about this, that the temple, there was a vessel that was sanctified, which means separated unto God for the purpose through which sacrifices were enabled to make their journey out of the earth right into heaven. He knows that. And he knows that the mouth plays that same role in the temple of God today. In other words, in the human body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So get this. We are talking about types and shadows. The physical temple was a type of the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is the body today. That's the physical body of a man, a woman. And there was a vessel there through which, here, sacrifices were enabled to journey out of the earth into heaven. And that vessel, the type of it is a type of the tongue. So he knows the mouth plays that role. And it's through the tongue or the mouth, words of prayer and praise ascend unto heaven. Now he also understands something and we need to know this. That the mouth also holds another vital role. Apart from transporting our sacrifices, our prayers, our petitions, our praise, worship to God, it now also draws on the grace that God supplies in response or in answer to the prayers, draws on the holiness and the grace of God and imparts it with our words into this material world in which we live. In other words, Jesus with his words transported his desire, his petition concerning Lazarus to God. And said, Father, I thank you because you hear me always. I'm saying this publicly that they might know that you have heard me. Then he drew on the results that was provided in the realm of the spirit through the mouth also to say, Lazarus, come forth. Now, so if we remove the work of the tongue and the mouth and you remove that completely out of take it out of the equation in the life of a person, you have taken away from that person. You have incapacitated that individual. It's just like having a football team 
and you have a, an objective, which is to score the goal, and you have one player that holds all other players together, he's responsible for taking the ball from the defense and distributing it to the attack. Very strategic, connects the entire team. You take that player out of the field, all right, then that whole team is going to begin to struggle. Satan knows that take the tongue out, take the mouth out of the equation here. This individual will struggle. So he understands it. However, there's something about that vessel that we need to mention. Certain things were not, once it was sanctified unto God, certain things were not to be placed inside that vessel. If it was placed inside that vessel, then the vessel becomes defiled in the eyes of God and can no longer be used, here is the point, for that purpose of enabling sacrifices to leave the earth and enter into heaven because it had been defiled. So it became impure on feet to fulfill that function. And God gave them that instruction. Now the vessel can be defiled by placing in it an offering that was contrary to the law that was written. Now I don't want to go into the Hebrew words, but it was called a particular name. All right? Now, it will be rendered useless once that was placed into it as an instrument of service unto God. Now, Satan knows that the mouth also, and I'll show this from scriptures, even in the New Testament, that once certain things are placed on the inside and the mouth gets defiled and the tongue is defiled by these things, then it is incapable of transporting and successfully the words of prayer and praise. Why do you think James said? Look at what James was saying. He said in James 3, 9, he says, Therewith we bless God, even the Father. Therewith we curse men. Once we allow curse words in, it says, which are made after the similitude of God. In other words, you see the image of God in people. He said, you curse them, then you are going to go and worship God's own image that you can't see. He said, look, out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter waters? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear? It means it is not possible. You can't use your tongue to speak ill of people all around and then get into a service and use it. Now, you can sing songs, but you cannot transport spiritual sacrifices to heaven when the lips are unclean. So evil communication, that's what he says, that proceeds out of the mouth of a person contaminates the vessel of God. So all Satan is trying to do is provoke these people. Now, if we understand these principles here, we'll see this, life, and, and we avoid this. Now, these are hidden things in life. You avoid this. This is so fundamental to successful, all right, living successfully on the earth. So fundamental to every single thing that you do on this earth and how you'll be rewarded in heaven. So fundamental. That's why David said, if a man will see good days and love life, let him refrain his tongue from speaking evil. We cannot with one mouth bless God and the same mouth curse men. So we are speaking about a legitimate message on confession. But we are talking about the purification of that vessel. Such that when you speak to a mountain, then the mountain has got to hearken unto you because your mouth there now is ca it's, it's capable, all right, of transmitting grace to move that particular mountain. That's why Paul was saying, if I have not love, he says, and, and, and I have faith to move mountains and I have not love, he it says it's nothing. 
He said, if there's no love, he said, and you are speaking with tongues of men and angels. Why did he say you are like a tinkling cymbal? In other words, there's no difference between you and a drummer who just hits the cymbal, pam, 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 pam. The whole one hour of prayer, you'll just be hitting the cymbal. He said, that's exactly what do you think he was talking about. These were Jewish people that understood the scriptures. So this more than any other thing incapacitates the Christian. Let me repeat this. The wrong use of your tongue speaking about people incapacitates the Christian. The temple of God, his presence among the Jews was destroyed in the past, which means where God, when God inhabited, and I will show this, the nation of Israel, and he inhabited the temple and will communicate, all that was destroyed. And it was destroyed because of words stemming out of the hearts of people from a place of baseless hatred that was causing division among people. Now, so one to eradicate out of your consciousness and out of your, out of your vocabulary there, right, this, the use of certain words where you expunge from your entire heart speaking in a certain way. Uh, some people might consider it work culture, but it, it's dramatically affecting the lives of people. Ephesians chapter 4 here and verse 29. It says, let no corrupt communication. This is what we're talking about. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good through the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. That means this corrupt communication is uh, it's not when you're saying, I won't make it. No, these are conversations you're having with people that is ministering to them something else than the grace of God. It says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, now, communication that will corrupt and defile. It says, but let it minister grace unto the hearers and grieve not the Holy Spirit. In other words, when corrupt communication proceeds, you grieve the Spirit of God. Now, if you grieve somebody, then the person folds their hands and stands aside. And grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness all wrath and anger, clamor, and what evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. This is what the scripture is saying. Same thing it says in James chapter 3, verse 6 to 10. We've read that. Put away this kind of speech. Bible says, be angry. All right, it's almost a commandment. Be angry. You've got to be, people do things. You, anger, anger in itself is not wrong. But he says, sin not. He says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Uh, the wrath of man walketh not the righteousness of God. There's a difference between anger and wrath. Wrath is when you step out in anger to, 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 in, to, in behavior or on your words that are injurious to people. Now, you can't be angry, but it says, make sure you don't cause pain in the life of any person by the anger that is stirred up. Bring about a change through that anger, but don't cause pain in people's lives. And it says, if you've stepped into wrath, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. In other words, you have done something that is wrong. Do not sleep. Don't let the sun go down. Confess that particular thing and, and, and do something about it before you go to bed that day. Don't sleep on wrong actions that are product of anger within your heart. So let's look at this here. How the whole, the nation of Israel, the, the presence of God was affected by words that were spoken. Now, quickly just look at this. I mean, this, there are many deep dimensions to this that we can go into. Isaiah chapter 6, very deep dimensions we can get into. So I might extend this beyond. Now look, look at what it says here. From verse 1. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He was sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train filled his temple. And then he saw angels. And they cried out in verse 3, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. 
and the door and the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then I said, or then said I, woe is me, for I am undone. Now listen to what Uzziah is saying here. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean. He, he saw God and knew that we've been, we have been saying wrong stuff. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. He saw Jesus and immediately said, oh. all right. Then flew one of the seraphims unto him, having a live coal in his hands, which he had taken from, with the tongues from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth. And that's what's going on in this series here. So purge us and touch thy lips. And that's exactly what's going on. Thy iniquity is taken away, thy sin is purged. Now, when that happened, then he was now useful. All right? Now useful. You can't be an effective minister, either in word or in song or in any other thing you are doing, if this is not done. Now, you can speak words, you can sing songs, but if there is, that's why the Bible says a man who doesn't bridle his tongue, his religion is vain. He doesn't know any, that person does not know God. James 1 says it. That person's religion is empty. Now, it says this here. It says, and I heard the voice say, whom shall I send? After it was, lips were purged. Who will go with, for us? Who will go for us? That's from heaven. Then said I, here I am, I am, send me. To do what? To go and preach exactly what he experienced. The purging of the tongue. That's what it was. Because he said, I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell among people with unclean lips. What else will the assignment be? Go and tell them. And then he said this, and he said, go tell these people, hear ye indeed, but you understand not. This is what's causing it. And see ye indeed, but you perceive not because of this unwholesome words that come out. Make the hearts of these people fat and make their ears heavy. And shut their eyes unless they see with their eyes and hear with their eyes and understand with their heart and be converted from what? Conversion from the use of your tongue wrongly. It says, and be healed. Now, look at what this does. Look at, this is the first thing, that this destroys the, the dwelling place of God. Then said, then said I, Lord, Lord, how long? He answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant and the houses without man and the land be utterly desolate and the Lord have removed men far away and there be a great forsaken in the midst of the land. Words. Now, the most wicked of all forms of evil speech is gossip. Let me repeat that. The most wicked of all... Now, this is the one that must, must be purged. Most wicked is gossip. And, and let me show you this. When the scripture says... I mean, I've mean, I said this, I've been studying the, the Torah, which is the books that Moses wrote from the eyes of rabbis. And I came to the conclusion from an insight I received. And then I found the scripture to back this. But that's not what I want to sit on just today. That when the scripture says that a person's labors will be found in the house of a stranger, what actually caused the problem was what the person was saying. In other words, nobody will reap the benefits of the labor of their hands if they, with their mouth, are involved in gossip where they walk. Now, put back that Ecclesiastes scripture. In fact, when I quoted it and I looked at it, it that scripture came again to me. Now, look at, look at what it says. Suffer not. Now, I, when I looked back, it was when I realized what it was saying again. Before I get into the scriptures, I, I know I just saw it now. Suffer not to cause thy flesh to sin, neither say thou before the angel, it was an error. Wherefore, should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thy hands? In other words, be angry but sin not. So you speak words of anger in an office, you destroy the work of your hands. Listen, what should accrue to you in life? 
the social capital that should come out, your networks. Because working diligently is not just about, all right, being paid. You are forming relationships and bonds, and people in that place will introduce you and open up doors for you. This is how the blessing comes. How did Joseph become prime minister? Somebody who was with him where he walked introduced him to the king. How did Mordecai sit at the right hand of the king? Because somebody who experienced. Now you destroy that capital. Within your network, when you speak words that are injurious to other people, wipes it out. So it tells us in, in Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 9. I said this, this. Now we, the problem is we only taught confession just as me saying the right thing, saying the right thing, trying to make it happen. Proverbs 5, 9. Lest thou give thy honor unto others and thy years to the cruel. Proverbs 5.10, lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labor be in the house of strangers. And thou mourn at last, when thy flesh and thy body are consumed, and say, how have I hated instruction, my heart despised reproof. That's correction. I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers. That at the end of your life, you look back and say, I, I disobeyed instruction, this instruction. He says, I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined my ear to those that instructed me. I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation. Evil speech. Proverbs 12 and verse 14 says it all. Proverbs 12 and verse 14. A man, listen to this, shall be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth. And the recompense of a man's hand shall be rendered unto him if, if what is coming out from his lips. That if not, if you are saying the wrong stuff, it says you will not be recompensed. Put that scripture again up here, which means you won't get the recompense in, and the recompense of a man's hand shall be rendered unto him. This is how people waste labor. It is referencing how evil communication with others deprives the Christian of the fruits of their labor. It wipes out social capital. Now, these are secrets, I'm telling you, in Scripture. Nothing again destroys the effect of your prayers, which means, number one, labor. It wipes out capital. Nothing destroys the effect of your prayers as evil speaking. Evil speech. Speaking evil of people. Now, show the four types of gossip you must desist from. First Peter 3, chapter 10, we know this. All right, it says, First Peter 3, 10, from 10 to 12. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil. That's what the scripture says. And his lips that they speak no guile. Verse 11. Let him ensue evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of God is against all them that do evil. Now, Hebrews chapter 4. I want to show you something here about prayers. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Now, your speech affects that. Your speech affects that. If you've been judgmental, if, you've been, if you have spoken words of condemnation, when you come up to the throne of mercy, uh, nothing for you there. Say, so how do we know? James here and chapter 2. Now, this will take away struggle from your life. You, you will say this here. James 2 and verse 12. It says, James 2, 12. So speak ye. Listen. So speak ye. So speak ye. And so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Now look at what it says next. For he shall have judgment without mercy that has shown no mercy. In other words, when you come up to the throne of grace, if your words have not been words, a merciful words, we'll talk about that next week. It says you will have judgment without mercy that has shown no mercy. 
For mercy rejoices against judgment or will override judgment if you have been a merciful person. So he says, when you come up in the day of judgment, every idle word you have spoken shall count against. He says, by thy words you will be judged, by thy words you'll be condemned, by thy words you'll be liberated. It's not just about saying good things about your own life. It's about the way you converse with people about people. So there are four types of speech that is forbidden by God. You know when God said, we'll say this next week, you can eat of anything, but this one, the day you touch it, you die. Listen, this is the test that God has for humanity. For he says, you have, he says, he says if you eat of this fruit, you shall die. You have passed from death to life, because you love your brethren. So it's a test of words. Four types of speech that is forbidden, that you don't touch. Number one, being a tail bearer. Now, I've told you gossip is, is the most wicked form of speech. Now, in this gossip, there are four classes. Being a tail bearer, which means derogatory or harmful speech related to a third party. In other words, there's a Mr. A, uh, Mr. B here. And then there's Mr. C, or Madam A, B, and C. Mr. A tells Mr. Now, you are Mr. C, they tell you information. Something is disclosed about another to you, the third party. All right? Or you hear something about somebody. Now, tail bearing is you go to meet a third party, you go to meet a third party and disclose that secret. For it tells us that a tail bearer revealeth secrets. Hear this. Proverbs 18.8. Proverbs 18.8. This is what a tail bearer does. The words of a tail bearer are as wounds. And they go into the innermost parts of the belly. Proverbs 2019. Proverbs 2019. He that goeth about as a tail bearer revealeth secrets, therefore meddle flattereth with his lips. Now, if anybody comes to reveal anybody's secrets to you, challenge that person. They are diseased from association with that person. Or else, your social capital, something will happen in the spirit realm. They will exchange your social capital. The relationships you have invested in, you will lose it, all right, into the hands of that person. Proverbs 26 and verse 20. Where no wood, wood is, there, there the fire goeth out. So where there no tail bearer is, strife ceaseth. In other words, a strife inside a place, in an office, in a family, there's somebody who is revealing secrets. All right, so it's to disclose something about another, and it's not part of any redemptive work or helping that person, but is intentional to expose something about that other person to somebody else that that individual doesn't know. Okay, so when you know secrets about people or you have certain information about people. You keep it between yourself and God Almighty and you pray for that particular person. You, and by that, you draw yourself closer to God and you come into a place of unusual favor because God knows you know a secret about my child and you are helping to keep that secret on this earth. And that's why it says love covers a multitude of sins. And this is what the scripture says about busy bodies. Number two, the second type is the peddler. One who sows discord among people. So Mr. A tells you, you something about Mr. B. All right, now the tail bearer reveals secrets. That he comes to know something and then he says it. But the peddler here is another form of gossip. But the peddler here is another form of gossip. So you hear Mr. A, all right, say something about Mr. B. 
you now go and meet Mr. B to say, let me tell you something. I heard Mr. A say about you. And you repeat it to Mr. B. And it wounds the heart of Mr. B. And because of that, when Mr. A meets Mr. B, there's a shift inside the heart because there's been somebody who has disclosed. Now, what you're doing there is, all right, you might say, well, a bit, that's not loyalty. You go there and plan. Now, what you should do, should do. Yeah, Mr. A says something on Mr. B that is derogatory or not nice. You challenge Mr. A right there. You tell the person, listen, would you be open to me calling Mr. B and bringing him to the table so we can have this discussion with Mr. B? Are you open to that? Because I'm not going to mention it ever to Mr. B. And this matter is not going to be repeated except, and, I will, and, and for you to be saying this, all right, I want you to say it so that we can resolve this and have peace with the person. Now, let me tell you what will happen. You will purge that individual of such speech. You will purge that person of such speech. Right? And that spirit starts moving far away from your own life. The third is a person who goes into what is called slander. That's a use of speech. Now, the tale bearer was revealing a secret that was true. The slander, person who is involved in slander is saying things that are false. Now, tale bearer is saying things that are true. All right? He's revealing secrets. He's, he's going to meet people and saying that, you know, this lady wants, you know, um, um, did that or this man once did this. Yeah, and it's, it's true. But it's a secret and it's revealing that secret for the purpose of damaging that person. And, and be careful because they are setting you up. If you don't challenge that thing, you'll find out that a seed has been sown in you that will trigger something in future. Now, the slanderer is a backstabber. One who speaks publicly or privately with one goal to destroy the other person. Slander is malicious and deliberate false information. Now, this false information is not true. Psalm 101 and verse 5. So the first is a tale bearer. The statements are true. The personal practice slander. He that giveth. 101 verse 5, not one, 101 verse 5. All right, quickly. Whoso privately slandereth his neighbor, him will I kill. That's what he's saying here. All right, that's what the scripture calls a whisperer. Okay, then the last one, pick up from here next week. Painful and insensitive speech, which means causing pain with words insensitive, you are not sensitive with your words and you hurt others. Thinking that your personal opinion on matters such as physical appearance, someone else's background are open for you, for your own frank discussion and to just throw out without recognizing and I mean, I mean, I joke, I have friends, I mean, it might be permissible to and friends to certain friends, I mean, there are certain friends that I have that, that they will tease me, and now it, they're comfortable with that. I'm comfortable with that. We have that type of relationship. They will tease me. If somebody, let's say, from my tribe, or I do something, they will tease me about it. From where I grew up, they will tease me about it. And if I see something else to, about their tribe, it's, but, but it's not, it's not I, won't, I won't say that to somebody. You know that we don't have that kind of relationship together, okay? But when you are insensitive and you cause pain, they are sensitive subjects to others, and those who lack basic sensitivity cause pain in many ways, all right, in their everyday interactions, living an emotional carnage. Proverbs 15 and verse 4. Proverbs 15 and verse 4. Quickly, close with this. And a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. Now put the amplified version. Amplified version. So we see what it means. A gentle tongue with it with its healing power, is a tree of life. But willful contrariness, it breaks down the spirit. From the, message trans uh, no, the message translation. All right, the message translation. Kind words heal and help. Cutting words wound and mean. You can wound the spirits of people. And Proverbs 17 and verse 22. 
Proverbs 17. Now, when you wound the person's spirit, eventually you affect the person's body and the person, all right, it can affect them physically. Proverbs 17, 22, I said. All right, verse 22. A merry heart doeth good like medicine, but a broken spirit dryeth the bones. And then 18, verse 14. Proverbs 18 and verse 14. It says here, uh, close there. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can, so it affects the person's body. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for this word. And I ask for this concerning every single person under the sound of my voice. That Lord, as the angel brought forth a burning coal and placed it on the lips of King Uzzah and purged him and his lips from all forms of uncleanliness. I ask in the name of Jesus that that same surgical operation or cause in the lives of every single person listening to this, that their words will be purged and purified such that their mouth becomes a sanctified and holy vessel unto you, transporting words of prayer and praise. And drawing on your grace and your holiness to impact and transform natural things in this world into that which is supernatural in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Well, we have a couple of announcements I'll, I'd like um, to make. First of all, we have a women's conference, which will be coming on on Saturday, the September 19th. Right, It's a virtual conference. And they have a list of very powerful women who will be speaking. Uh, Pastor Becky Pauli Nietzsche, um, Pastor Taylor Madu. Um, very powerful women who have gathered there to speak at this particular meeting. So I urge all women, and I'm sure men also since it's virtual, will be able to glean certain principles and listen in, right? Since we're all connecting uh, through the internet. So that's coming up 10 a.m. September 19th, that's Saturday, um, next week. The week after that, they have their Eduate Teachers Conference, and then we'll have the platform on the 1st of October. It's going to be a very um, strategic meeting in this nation. Now, we'll take our offerings here. We understand that offerings are free will things you do, uh, things that of your own free volition you give unto God. These are the most impactful forms of giving. Uh, it's you purpose inside your heart what you want to give unto him and then you give it on to God and God responds to that offering causing his grace to abound towards you. So on the screens you'll have uh, the way and manner in which you can give while I pray over your offerings. Father in the name of Jesus Christ your children have brought forth their offerings unto you this morning. They have given as they have purposed inside their hearts. And now I speak over these gifts that they have brought forth. That grace be imparted into it and it be transformed into spiritual sacrifices that ascend into the heavens and enter into your very presence. And let these things provoke your grace to be poured forth that every single thing they've sought upon this earth by your spirit be found, that their eyes be optioned up this moment to see the patterns, to see the formation of the spirit and the way in which they ought to go in order to bring about the realization of those things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Now, for those watching online, we have something we'll be doing additionally for your experience all right, putting this into experience every week, we're going to be having uh, community groups um, uh, um, come in to discuss the content of what goes on there. Community groups uh, are what you will call cell-like structures that we have within the church uh, where people come together, similar profession, same demographic, for an exchange of knowledge and creating a family spirit where this kind of information 
will be passed across to people. Uh, so I'll transfer you over to the studio where that discourse uh, will commence this moment. Thank you for watching once again and God bless you.